Thank you. Thank you, Kalpana, and thanks for giving a, a really nice overview of the project. Uh, so as, as you've already said, I'm Ayana Datta. I'm the principal investigator. Um, and what I want to do in the time that I have is really give you an overview of the project itself, where we are and where we're going from now on. And uh, after me, we have a series of presenters who are part of the core project team who are going to talk about different aspects of the project that they're working on and that have unfolded over this past year. So um, the project itself that was funded by Arts and Humanities Research Council is called Gendering the Smart City. And we were really interested in looking at how the smart city, which is a top-down vision of technocratic urbanism, uh, could be spoken to and spoken against from the bottom, from the grassroots. Um, and really to understand not the smart city technology per se, but how technology is actually used uh, in the margins to experience and uh, struggle for the daily struggles in the city. So uh, our project, if you're interested, uh, that's the, hash uh, the hashtag today is Anajana. So if you are tweeting, please use the hashtag Anajana so we know what's, uh, what, you're, what you're saying about it. But also the project handle, uh, the Twitter handle is uh, at Gender Smart City. So uh, you can also go uh, on the project handle and have a look at the stuff that we've been doing. <coughs> So uh, just to start with, the key aim of this HRC project, it's part of an international uh, highlight uh, notice on uh, development. So the money comes from DFID, ODI, and all sorts of other international development organizations located in the UK. Uh, and the key objective is that we address the sustainable development goals. And in this particular project, we were interested specifically on two of the goals, which is uh, goal five and goal 11. Goal five being gender equality, uh, particularly around eliminating forms of violence against all women and girls in public and private sphere. Uh, specifically, one of the targets uh, in sustainable development goal five is the, the increasing the proportion of individuals who own a mobile phone by sex. So generally, that women should have more mobile phones, and that's seen as an indicator of fulfilling the SDG goals. Uh, and I'll talk to that in a minute uh, about how we interpreted that. And the second goal, of course, is the SDG 11, which is sustainable cities and communities, which, again, our interpretation was around the safety and inclusivity of women in the margins living in the urban peripheries and how they are able to access particularly public transport, but also different spaces in their home, in their neighborhood, and the city at large. So keeping these two goals in mind, our project question, so these are the overall, the broader questions in the project, is looking at the smart city. The first question is, how are visions of the smart city mobilizing approaches to gender mobility and violence against women? And that is really the top-down vision of the smart city. And, and we were thinking about it not just as the smart city, but the smart, safe city. What are the approaches to safety in the top-down vision of the smart city? And then for us, what we've been working on in the past year is how can we address VAW and SDGs 5 and 11 by innovating on digital technologies and improving women's knowledge of and safe access to infrastructure in the Indian city. And again, infrastructure we mean in a very broad way. We mean both the everyday infrastructures of water, sanitation, etc., but also the infrastructure of transport and the infrastructure of digital technology. So that's the key aims and the key uh, broad questions around this. The way we wanted to address this question was not actually through regular conventional research, although that forms a small part of it. But the key aim of this project was that we are going to co-produce particular types of outputs that speak back to the top-down vision of the smart city. And we are going to co-produce this with the participants in the urban peripheries. So. Before I go to what we are thinking of and our methods, let me just introduce the core team again. So that's myself and Marta. Uh, and we are the UK-based team, very thin in the UK. But uh, there's, I can assure you that we are constantly on the phone with or between all of us and the project team. Uh, I'm the pr uh, principal investigator. And Marta, I'm sure all of you have got at least one email from Marta or been tweeted and tagged by Marta on Twitter. She is our admin officer and a social media officer, and she's been doing a brilliant job trying to keep us all together. The India team, 
the core India team is Arya, who is sitting there, research assistant, and you hear from all of us uh, today. Uh, she has been uh, unbelievable in keeping us together and doing all the groundwork uh, in Delhi. Uh, so uh, thank you very much, Arya, and, and she, you'll hear from us particular from her particularly about uh, some of the methods that we've been using with the participants. Then, of course, uh, Padmini, uh, Dr. Padmini Ray Mare, she is um, the co-investigator, and she actually represents Design Beku. Now, uh, we don't have Srishti. We have Design Beku as our uh, partner. Um, and uh, she's been working with Srishti, and uh, now she has her own digital humanities uh, uh, in consultancy. consultancy. And uh, so she's been uh, invaluable in uh, understanding the digital humanities aspect of it. And between Padmini and I, um, we are also uh, leading on different aspects of the project. As I will explain later on, this is the Delhi aspect of the project I've been leading, and Padmini is going to now lead uh, in the next part of the project, which is moving to Bangalore. And then, of course, Kalpana Vishwanath Kalpana, who has uh, been unbelievable as a partner from as a safety pin. Uh, we, we actually have three projects together. This is one of our three projects. And we've, it's been a very successful partnership. Um, uh, and also because Safety Pin particularly is working with digital technology um, on safety. And then we have our local partners who are specific to each city. Um, and, and there's Jagori. I see a lot of Jagori team members present here. Jagori, which is the feminist NGO who's been working for a very long time in Madanpur Khadar, where our field site was with uh, participants. And um, they've been unbelievable, again, in providing support and facilitating the whole process. And um, who do I see here? Sunita is here. Um, Shruti is here. Uh, so uh, there'll be other people coming. Uh, of course, also the participants themselves will be arriving very soon. I hear there's somewhere stuck near Ashram. Um, then the urban design department from SPA Delhi, uh, Riti is uh, here. Uh, Riti represents some of the SPA Delhi work, uh, but also there'll be other SPA people arriving. And uh, it's been very interesting because SPA has actually had a specific project in their studio that provides design interventions in Kadar, in the field side that we've been working in. And some of the SPA students are here as well, so welcome. Um, then we have the creative team, who, again, we couldn't have done without. This is the co-production that I was talking about. And we have two of the creative team members here. Uh, well, they, I think they haven't come. They're going to be coming soon. Uh, Sunaina, who's been working with the participants in, actually, the music production. And Nandan, who's been doing the filming. Uh, with me and Arya and uh, uh, another cin cinematographer, and it's been an un unbelievable experience, and we can talk about that again later. So just moving on from there, what have been our activities? We've, uh, this is a project for 24 months. We, we're coming down to the 12 months of the first 24 months. Uh, in India, we've had a series of workshops, uh, which uh, largely Arya, but also sometimes Padmini I and Kalpana have been, and, and Riti have been part of, uh, working with the participants, uh, thinking through some of their experiences in, in moving around in their daily mobilities and with violence, uh, and producing these cultural products, as you will see later. We've also had a series of capacity building workshops with participants around digital technologies, around music production, around filming, and so on. Um, we have the exhibition, which Kalpana has already explained, in Monday House, starting from the 1st of January, and it's going to run for the whole month of January. Um, in the UK, we've, um, as pr a principal investigator, it's been a continuous, constant process of uh, overviewing, networking, and day-to-day -day management of the project, and particularly given one of the methods we've had, which is WhatsApp diaries, which I happen to be part of, and it was, it was unbelievable, because I used to get WhatsApp diary entries at four or three in the morning, and I would wake up and see somebody stuck in the metro somewhere with pictures coming in. So it's, it's been, I feel like I've been there all the time, and that's, that's been a wonderful experience. Um, we've also had regular project team meetings via Skype and face-to-face -face contact. There's also an advisory board uh, who have been very active in giving us support and advice. And then finally, the plan is that in January 2020, when this, this 24 months is over, we'll have the project exhibition uh, and international conference in London. We're, we're going to take all of this material back to London. So uh, our methods, we've had a number of different types of methods. Uh, one of them have been the old form of traditional interviews, the semi-structured interviews, and some mental mapping with the participants. And that, that actually was how it all started with, with uh, Safety Pin and King's College in partnership. This, this was a small seed funding which we got from King's College London to just start doing this work. And from that 
initial semi-structured interviews in Madanpur Khadr with the participants, we landed up with this with this big project. So the interviews are actually the, the earlier part of this project. We've also had safety audits done by Jagori uh, through uh, participatory walkabouts and safety pin night audits, which again, Jagori team members and safety pin team members will talk about after myself. Um, the key aspect that uh, we have, I have been as a project investigator uh, involved in are the WhatsApp diaries with Arya. Arya has been managing and, and um, Sarita as well, who's the, one of the Jaguri team members, have been organizing the WhatsApp diaries. And this is really where we all came together with the participants in, in a group talking about uh, everyday experiences and daily struggles with mobility, with the home, with all sorts of things in the, in the neighborhood and in the city. Uh, another aspect of this has been the Wikipedia page which Padmini has been leading, and Padmini will talk about that again today. Uh, and then the, finally, the exhibition. So that's the curation part of the methods. And then the last part of the methods has been the co-production. Again, I've been quite involved in particularly the video and the film of the, of the music version. So we have uh, Khadar Ki Larki, a hip-hop song that's been co-produced with the participants. Uh, with Sunana, Arya, and the participants, and that's been quite an intense experience. Again, uh, a lot of that has also infiltrated in the, the digital, di uh, the WhatsApp diaries, so I've been also part of that and seeing that. Uh, but the video is where it has really literally happened last week, and we, we've been uh, totally exhausted and totally exhilarated with the whole experience working with the participants, and we've, we're going to show that after lunch. Um, so just kind of an overview, uh, the smart safe city, how do we understand the smart safe city? And this is, I'm really speaking more from the Delhi aspect. Uh, so the key approach to safety in the smart city, the key top down approach is usually more CCTV cameras, more surveillance, more police presence. Um, and the, the notion that safety can be fixed through technology, that it can be fixed by counting and measuring um, and increasing the monitoring and control of cities and urban spaces. But obviously, that's, that's not correct. And, and we know by working with participants, and we know from all our research, that that is not the way safety is, is felt or experienced uh, or even um, perceived. So safety is one of the key things we found is it's highly temporal. So a space that might feel safe in the morning might not feel safe at any other time of the day. It's highly subjective. Uh, and it's also uh, not something that you can measure. Um, and this is, this is something that, uh, without going too much into academic literature, I just want to throw this out, uh, this, one of the new um, articles by Anita Gurumurthy and Chami, which talks about the city becoming understood through an ICT-mediated social order. Uh, and that's really something that we are addressing or challenging through this particular project. So um, our whole theme in Delhi is called Ana Jana. And uh, we found that Ana Jana was actually a really useful, um, really useful way, a lens to think about all sorts of interactions between the digital and the phys physical, and all sorts of interactions between the women in the peripheries and the, the smart city in the center. But the Ana Jana was also, uh, we felt, was historical, because the Ana Jana is about the history of these participants who came, whose, whose parents or grandparents came to the city as migrants. Um, and they, over time, settled in the city and, and settled in informal settlements, for example, uh, lived life, had their livelihoods, but then were also forcefully evicted. Uh, in the case of Madanpur Khadr, particularly, forcefully evicted from the city post-2000 after the Almitra Patel ruling. Uh, and all of them talk about it. Some of them don't really remember it because they were much too young, but they all talk about being uh, evicted and coming from Arkipuram, Khadr, uh, Nehru Place, um, and Nizamuddin Bastis into Madanpur Khadr. So there is the jana from the city, the jana to the city historically as migrants, and then also jana, forcefully jana from the city um, into, uh, into the periphery. So uh, this, is, this is a picture which um, is actually from my, the book that I have uh, published, but it's, uh, it's a collation of all the sites from where participants were removed uh, and, and pushed out into the peripheries, these red dots. Um, and we are looking at Madanpur Khadr here. So this was the particular settlement that we've been working in. Uh, 
then we, uh, the way we are thinking about this again is the, the connected, the connected peripheries. So they, this is the paradox of living in the peripheries like Madanpur Khadar, uh, because the peripheries themselves are sites that are created out of forceful evictions. But the peripheries are also connected in the sense that most of the participants, most of the people who live there, also have access to mobile telephones. They have access to cheap data. They have access to uh, networks. Uh, and they are able to access uh, the internet or the, the chat rooms, the WhatsApp rooms, and the Facebook rooms uh, much easily. So on the one hand, there is a sense of exclusion that they've been pushed out into the peripheries. But on the other hand, there's a sense of freedom that the mobile phone gives them, that they are no longer excluded also from the information. Um, and this is particularly given the, the rise of new media and forms of ICD since the mid-2000s, uh, mid uh, which, uh, which Hoesler talks about as a silent revolution. So people gaining a lot of access to mobile phones. And there's been this generational buildup, therefore, of digital capacity, particularly amongst millennials. And some of the participants with us, working with us are millennials. Um, and these connected peripheries is really the paradox of life in the peripheries. So while physical infrastructure might not be very good, you might not always get water or electricity or have very good public transport, but the digital in infrastructure enables you to have this aspiration of inclusion or the, the imaginary of being part of the city, of having an urban identity. So I'm going to very quickly uh, run through this. Uh, there's also a Sway map which I can circulate the link to. Uh, but how we have thought about it is this continuous ana jana. So there's this ana to digital space. And participants talk about coming to digital space as a, as a sense of freedom, because that was one of the first things that they bought was the mobile phone when they started working. And they bought this mobile phone by saving money and trying to convince their families to allow them to use the phone, because the phone was also seen as a, as a, as a tool of empowerment. But also then the phone becomes something else. Uh, it becomes a prolific, prolific selfie-taking tool. And, um, and, and we're going to see this in a minute. There's all the time the selfies begin to start defining a different sense of identity, a different sense of taking back control from the digital technology and presenting oneself in a particular way to others. Then there is Jana from home. So you come into digital space, Anna to digital space, but also that means you also want to go into the city, get employment, get education. And Jana for a home is always difficult. It's always a struggle. You have to negotiate with your family. You have to negotiate ways to explain to them that this is not something you're going out to do something wrong, but you're going out to do bona fide legitimate work. And this Jana for home, the WhatsApp, and by the way, all these pictures are from the WhatsApp diary. So the the WhatsApp diary was full of pictures of going out, how to go out, and what it means to go out, catching public transport, having this uh, negotiation of a homemaker identity vis-a-vis -vis going out into the city as a working woman. Then, um, so we had loads of, uh, these are the different pictures of the community, but we had this uh, time mapping series, and this comes from one of the Jagori maps where they were working with the women in the community trying to create maps of day and night. And as you can see, this was the whole temporality that came across where particular spaces would be safe in day because there, was, there were women there, but at night there would be increased men, and so therefore they would be understood as unsafe. So this whole notion of temporality is something that they have to negotiate constantly in their anajana from and to the city. Um, and then they come Anna to the cities. They have Anna to digital space, Jana from home, and then Anna to the city, where coming to the city is also about increased violence, people staring at them, uh, people taking pictures of them through mobile phones. And one of the encounters is that they found someone taking their picture and stopped them and actually deleted the pictures from there. So a lot of the WhatsApp diary entries are about uh, this, this notion of negotiating uh, both violence but also infrastructure in the city. So one of the... Uh, key things that came out is during the monsoons, and we had it was flooded with loads and loads of pictures of waterlogged cities and how they were struggling to get to workplace or education because of um, because of a lack of access to infrastructure and transport and communications. 
And then finally, Jana from Digital Space. So some of them are, uh, well, actually, all of the participants don't really use browsers that much. They are still actually confined into these small spaces of the WhatsApp groups. They're confined into um, uh, Facebook. And uh, that really means that some of the information that is circulated across the WhatsApp groups are not necessarily information that they find objectively through the internet, through internet browsers. Uh, and sometimes that information is therefore uh, projected onto the mobile phone as something not always a positive thing that you know people can watch porn uh, videos, people can do things that are not uh, giving women freedom in uh, in using the mobile phone in that particular way. Um, and so one of the outputs that Padmini is going to talk about is how uh, in the editathon then we started to think about what is a fact and how do we find facts through browsers rather than getting forwarded messages um, via WhatsApp, which might actually be fake news. So actually getting access to the correct factual information rather than forwarded messages. And then finally, the co-production. So the co-production emerged from the number of selfies that proliferated the WhatsApp diary. And uh, there were dozens and dozens and dozens, I'm going to stop, uh, dozens and dozens and dozens of selfies that came out. Um, and so uh, it just... Uh, it just came together as a way to think about these selfies, again, as an urban identity. But then um, I thought that, well, since this, their identity is so much about taking selfies and projecting themselves, let put, let's put the selfies together in creating something that also presents them as a collective. So I put together these uh, different versions of their selfies together. And, and what you have with you in the in the t-shirt, I hope all of you've got one, um, is one of those versions of the selfies, which are really cut and pasted from the different selfies that each of these uh, girls put up on the WhatsApp diary and, and put together. And that then became the poster for the song as well. Um, and you can see here, again, we've, ha we've had this selfie workshop with them. And through that, then it began, began to emerge as, um, I won't talk about findings. We can talk about this. So it began to emerge uh, that we needed to say something. Uh, the girls needed to say something about themselves that was truly an urban identity, but also truly included Khadr as an urban space. So it became Khadr Ki Larkia. And that's the song that you were going to hear in the afternoon. Uh, well, maybe I will say something about key findings. So one of the key findings, I think, out of all of this is that owning a mobile phone is not the same as digital capacity. And that's where how we're going to feed back into the sustainable development uh, goals, that there is a reliance and restriction into closed spaces. And if you think about digital space also uh, as analogous to physical space, they do remain still confined and ghettoized into particular types of digital spaces like WhatsApp and Facebook. And therefore, exclusion from the wider knowledge and information networks that is provided by browsers has a huge impact on how they think about themselves, how they are able to then access services uh, provided by government schemes and so on and so forth. Uh, and the other thing that we found is that the phone and the city, and actually the body, the body of these participants through the selfies, are totally interlinked. And each provides a navigation to tool for the other. And we can explore that today for the rest of the day. Um, and then, of course, finally, safety and mobility is made out of the links between the home, the phone, and the city. The phone is a huge aspect of understanding what the city is about and how to negotiate their anajana from the home. Thank you. <laughs> 